Good morning, Southeast Rally. My name is Brooke Bailey Peters, and I serve as the Visitor Relations Specialist for the North Carolina State University Libraries. And today I'm very excited to welcome you to a special presentation on 1960s and 1970s student activism here on campus. But before we dive into the content, I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to your presenters. Todd Kuzmerich is the Interim Associate Head of the Library's Special Collections Research Center, and since 2004 has served as our university archivist. He holds a Master of Library Science and a Master of the Arts and History from the University of Maryland at College Park. As the university archivist, he collects and preserves materials documenting NC State University history, and he helps make that history more accessible to our community and to other researchers. This morning, he will be presenting with Colin Keenan, who is a university library specialist. Colin can often be found in the virtual reality studio, the 3D scanning studio, or maintaining the technology that relates to those spaces. He sees his greatest role in those areas as empowering users and the student staff to feel at home there and confident enough to fail, knowing that there's a resource to help those failures culminate in something constructive. Colin believes that technology is only as good as the connection it forms between people, and I am excited to see how he'll be using technology to connect with all of you this morning while helping to highlight some of Todd's work on student activism. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I think that you are in for something really special. And from here, I will turn you over to Todd and Colin. Okay. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Brooke, and hello, Southeast Raleigh Magnet High School. We'd like to welcome you to this virtual space that we have created and an exhibit that reviews a period of student activism on the NC State campus during the 1960s and 1970s. I'm Todd Kosmerick, or at least you're seeing my avatar in the festive sweater here. My colleague, Colin Keenan, is operating the camera, so you won't see him or his avatar until maybe the end. And then Colin has also created this virtual space, and we are excited to show that to you today. We're going to walk you through this exhibit, and I will talk to you about what you are seeing. At a later time, you can return to this virtual space and spend more time here. So let's get started. The 1960s and early 1970s was a time period when college students across the United States and around the world staged demonstrations and marches protesting against social conditions and questioning government policies, especially the Vietnam War. NC State University has never been known as a center of protest, but at that time, especially the years 1968 to 1972, many students were drawn into the racial justice and anti-war movements. Most of the photos in this exhibit and most of the information in my presentation come from one of the NC State student newspapers called The Technician, as well as um, some content from the annual yearbook, which is called the Agrimac. As student publications, they generally treated the student movements favorably. There are signs, however, that indicate that many faculty members, university administrators, and even some other students disapproved of and sometimes actively opposed the protests. So now I'm gonna teleport us to um, our first station. So bear with me while I do that. And we're gonna, um, I'm not so much gonna walk through this exhibit as teleport us through it um, to kind of save some time here. So let's start the tour by looking at a time period before the one in which this exhibit focuses. Then NC State student protests were more likely concerned about campus issues rather than national ones. For example, in 1962, officials wanted to change the school's name from NC State College to the University of North Carolina at Raleigh or UNC Raleigh or just plain UNCR. This resulted in considerable student opposition as seen in the photograph behind me. The initial protests had only partial success and for two years, the university was known by the very awkward name of North Carolina State of the University of North Carolina at Raleigh, which is quite a mouthful. 
By 1965, however, continued efforts by students and especially by alumni resulted in the adoption of the official name and still the current name of the university as North Carolina State University. Now we'll teleport to the next station. Here we're going to focus on the year 1963 when the nature of protests at NC State began to change. During the early 1960s, racial segregation was still legal in Raleigh and North Carolina, but the civil rights movement was forcing changes. Following the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision, NC State and other white only North Carolina colleges and universities began to integrate. The 1960 Greensboro sit-in led to sit-ins and protests in other Southern cities, calling for integration of restaurants and other businesses. In April, 1963, eight NC State students joined with some Shaw University students in protesting the segregationist policies of a movie theater in downtown Raleigh, as seen in these clippings from the Technician Student Newspaper. At the same time, United Nations Delegate Angie Brooks from Liberia spoke on the NC State campus and also the Shaw University campus. Afterwards, a couple of NC State students and a faculty member accompanied her to two local restaurants that refused her service because of their segregation policies. This is described in the clipping at the lower left. It is ironic that Brooks received this treatment because later she became the president of the UN General Assembly and she was the first African woman to hold that position. Also in 1963, NC State's student government and its faculty senate passed resolutions calling for racial integration in Raleigh. Baxter's, which was a popular restaurant with students on Hillsborough Street, had desegregated by that time. On the national stage, 1963 was the year that we witnessed the Medgar Evers assassination in Mississippi, but it was also the year of the March on Washington and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Now we're going to fast forward to 1968. On April 4th, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis and protests and riots began that same day in a number of US cities, including Raleigh. The Raleigh News and Observer published a letter from two NC State University political science professors expressing sorrow at the civil rights leaders killing. A few days later, on April 7th, 200 students and faculty members assembled on NC State's campus in order to march to downtown Raleigh. This group also included some students from Chapel Hill and Durham, too. When they left university property and began walking down Hillsborough Street, they encountered the police and the university chancellor, John Caldwell, who successfully persuaded them to disband. This is seen in some of the student newspaper photos um, that we've shown here. That evening, some NC State students and faculty members joined 3,000 others who attended a memorial service for Dr. King in Raleigh's Memorial Auditorium, which is now called the Duke Energy Center. And this is described in the clippings also here. Now we are going to teleport to events in 1969. And let me, I got, a, I got two little stops to do that. So bear with me. And here we are, 1969. The concern with racial justice continued among some NC State students from 1968 into 1969. In February of 1969, NC State held its third annual international fair. 
the fair gave international students an opportunity to display their culture and to give American students more knowledge about their culture. Fair organizers displayed South African travel posters that focused on that country's geography and ignored its racial laws. At that time in South Africa, they had a system of institutionalized racial segregation and white rule that was called apartheid. Some African-American students at NC State objected to the display because it presented South Africa in a positive light. One of the first black student groups at NC State called the Society of Afro-American Culture created a counter exhibit in the student union to tell the truth about the African country. Some of their display is seen in these photos. And now we are going to teleport to other events in 1969. And I'm just, bear with me because my little marker, there we go. Okay. So during the 1968-1969 academic year, protests were occurring on several U.S. college and university campuses, and they were driven by anti-racist, anti-war, and just plain anti-authority sentiment of students. Student strikes at Columbia University in New York and San Francisco State College are just a couple of the more famous examples. Here in North Carolina in February 1969, African-American food workers staged a strike at UNC Chapel Hill and African-American students seized a building at Duke University. At NC State University, a group of mainly black facilities workers, sometimes called physical plant employees, called for better pay, status, and working conditions. The Society of Afro-American Culture which um, I introduced in the last station um, as one of the first black student groups on campus, they helped organize a February 28th rally supporting the workers and one to 200 students, faculty members and physical plant employees participated in that rally. And that's seen in the image behind me. And I'm just gonna turn around for a second because there's something in that image I wanted to point out. The person holding the, um, the loudspeaker at the far right, um, his name is uh, Eric Moore. And in a few, he is the, um, at the time this photo was taken on February 28th, 1969, he was the um, president or head of the Society of Afro-American Culture. And then a few months after this photo was taken, he uh, was elected the student Senate president, um, which is part of student government at NC State. Um, and he was the first African-American to have be elected to that position. So now we are going to teleport again, just slightly reorient, reorient myself here. Okay. Chancellor John Caldwell responded to the February 20th rally by calling for a convocation on campus at which he spoke and told campus protesters to, quote, stop being so disgustingly self-righteous. Um, he is represented in the photo behind me. Um, he's at the far right um, speaking at the podium. Um, in his Speech, he also implored African-American students to, quote, let us continue to work together, end quote. And he emphasized to all students that, quote, the law will be enforced on this campus properly, end quote. I think he was worried that there might um, be violence that would break out as part of the protests. During the next month, um, so we're now in March of 1969, Employees presented a list of 43 demands to the chancellor and their ranks grew as campus laundry workers joined them. Student rallies continued to show support for them. One of the workers' demands concerned dormitory work assignments. During the 1960s, NC State had separate residence halls for men and women 
and there were some African-American women employees who were employed to clean the male dormitories. They requested to be reassigned to other buildings, and at first the university agreed, but then in April, the university reversed itself. When these women refused to work in the male dormitories, they were dismissed. Employees immediately staged a sit-in at the chancellor's office, and they were arrested as seen in the um, images um, on the left or on your left. Students protested outside the, um, the building that holds the chancellor's office. And later that evening, a group marched to the chancellor's residence, which is um, what is today the Gregg Museum on campus. And that is seen, um, yeah, Colin has moved the camera to show that for you. Um, the, um, they, they were carrying uh, torches, that's, um, that's what that is. They were um, carrying torches as they walked from uh, like the kind of gathering spot on campus to the chancellor's residence. Students and employees continued their protests throughout the month of April and into May, but the movement actually fizzled out by the end of the school year. In the end, the only employee demand that was met by the university was that the introduction of Black Studies classes in the curriculum in the fall of 1969. And none of the employees that had been, in, had been fired were reinstated. So now we're going to teleport um, down the hall here um, to continue looking at other events of the 1969 1970 school, um, well, um, to, yeah, to look at events of the 1969-1970 school year um, when those protests mostly focused on the Vietnam War. Okay, so we are now in the fall of 1969. By the late 1960s, the Vietnam War had students' attention across the country. The war pitted the United States and South Vietnam against communist-controlled North Vietnam. Thousands of American soldiers were dying and there was no end in sight. An anti-war movement mushroomed on college campuses in just a few years. This movement had been low key on the NC State campus that is, until the fall of 1969. A nationwide student group called the New Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam, or New Mob for short, formed that year with chapters on several college campuses, including the NC State campus. In October and November of 1969, they organized multiple protests against the war. New Mobe declared October 15th as Vietnam Day or Moratorium Day. At NC State, this was more of a teaching event than a protest with faculty lectures and student discussion groups held on key aspects about the war. On the University Plaza, which is better known as the Brickyard, it's the central gathering spot on campus, um, so on the brickyard, a group of students read the names of 39,000 Americans killed in the war up to that point. Also, an anti-war film titled In the Year of the Pig was screened on campus. And on the left are clippings from the October moratorium. And on the right is a promotional pamphlet for the film that was screened in the year of the pig. The moratorium continued in November with huge events in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco, San Francisco. In the nation's capital, there was a march of 40,000 people, each carrying a sign with the name of a dead American soldier. Behind me is one of the images of 
that march. And I'm going to turn around here and talk to you a little bit about this image. This image was taken by an NC State student who was there. Um, it shows the marchers um, carrying their, each one carrying a sign walking down the sidewalk. They're crossing the Arlington Bridge, um, which goes from um, Virginia, actually from Arlington National Cemetery, goes across the Potomac River into Washington, D.C. And the um, person who's taking the pictures um, was um, probably standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and looking west. And this picture um, ended up being published in the um, student yearbook the following year. Um, on the, um, so that march in Washington, D.C. took place, I think, on um, November 13th and 14th, um, 1969. And then on November 15th, um, about 500,000 people assembled on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Um, to protest against the war. Uh, at that time, that was considered the largest protest ever in the nation's capital. Um, but since then, there have been um, protests that have been considered larger in more recent decades. So at those um, Washington, D.C. events in uh, November 1969, between 150 and 250 NC State students attended them um, with um, new MOVE um, organizing the bus transport from Raleigh. Um, there were um, people attending that, um, that, those protests in Washington that across the country. Uh, many students signed a peace pledge committing themselves to, quote, absolute nonviolence and non-provocation, end quote, in order to minimize police confrontations, of which there ended up being very few. It was a very peaceful protest, despite the huge number of people. One student called this huge gathering a political Woodstock in reference to the folk and rock music festival of approximately 400,000 people that had occurred in New York just a few months earlier. So now we are going to teleport down the hall here um, to look at um, protests that happened at the end of the 1969-1970 school year. But first, we're going to make a little stop right here. No, I think I went too far, didn't I? OK, bear with me, because I have gotten myself lost here. I am just going to walk. There we are. <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, sorry about that. Uh, sometimes um, I'm going to blame it on my avatar. My avatar sometimes um, uh, kind of trips over itself. OK, uh, be, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the fact that no, there wasn't uh, unanimous support for these protests among the student body. In fact, there was actually some criticism against these protests, um, and some of that came from other students. Um, many students, though, um, appear to have been indifferent about the protests or maybe were just preoccupied with academics. I was able to find some criticism against the protests in letters to the editor of the technician student newspaper and we've displayed some of those here that um, the camera is um, kind of looking at. Um, I'll also add that um, uh, I gave um, a version of this presentation to an alumni group a few months ago, and there um, were some of the people um, who attended that that were um, had been students at, at this time period at NC State. And they told me that they really didn't have time to protest because they were much too busy studying. Um, and, uh, you know, some people that were like in the, um, the really difficult engineering and science programs were, were, you know, just spent all their time studying. They couldn't, they couldn't participate in the protests, even if they'd wanted to. Uh, 
Okay, we're gonna go down this short little hallway and talk about the, um, the end of the 1969-1970 um, academic year um, when there were more anti-war protests. And those were um, triggered by um, uh, the killings at Kent State University. So on May 4th, 1970, um, there was a protest at Kent State University in Ohio, and it turned deadly when the National Guard shot and killed four students. And this was, a, um, this was quite a change in reaction against the protest movement. Um, uh, a lot of people um, joined in the protest that ha hadn't really um, participated before. And U.S. college campuses exploded in demonstrations across the country. On May 8th, 1970, 6,000 students from NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, and other universities marched from the university's brickyard down Hillsborough Street to downtown Raleigh. And one of the newspaper clippings that we have here shows that, as well as the image behind me shows that. Um, it's one of the few color images I've been able to find of that event. Uh, one leader of this march was Kathy Sterling, who had just been elected NC State student body president, and she was actually the first woman to hold that position. She is seen in some of the images um, down the hall um, here. And she and other NC State students called for a peace retreat to be held on campus so that students could study and discuss the war rather than hold demonstrations and marches. They conceived of the peace retreat as an alternative to classes, but that would require faculty approval, you know, students going to the peace retreat instead of going to class. And it seemed unlikely that the faculty would um, agree to that. At a May 13th faculty meeting, which is uh, seen in the other image um, there that the camera's pointing at, a Ster Sterling's group made their case and they succeeded. The, factually, the faculty actually approved the proposal. And so the peace retreat was able to happen. It began on May 18th and it continued for at least a week. Like the moratorium day from the previous October, faculty and students held lectures and discussions and organizers researched and issued a group of Vietnam crises research reports, which are seen on the, um, on the little table um, that's kind of off to the side of the hallway there. So now we are going to um, teleport just a short distance um, to talk, um, to kind of fast forward to 1972. In April of 1972, events in Vietnam resulted in e even more protests across the United States, um, very similar to what happened in May of 1970 that we just looked at. On April 16th, about 100 people, um, including NC State students and faculty members, held a protest in downtown Raleigh at the State Capitol building. A few days later, students organized a demonstration on campus and more than 1,000 people marched down Hillsborough Street, um, that 1,000 numbers, according to the student newspaper. Um, that was, um, you know, that was kind of the trend that, that uh, students would gather on campus and then march down Hillsborough Street. The march included a group of Vietnam veterans um, or they were called, and they were called Vietnam Veterans for Peace, and they carried a body bag symbolizing the soldiers who had died in the war. And we show a picture of that, um, kind of up on the, it's the upper picture uh, behind me. Um, I don't know if, um, hopefully that's a good shot of that. 
Okay, so now we are getting towards the end of the exhibit and we're gonna protest, or we're gonna teleport to the last protest um, that we're gonna talk about today. And bear with me while I orient myself, there we go. So our last look today at student activism on the N NC State campus or with NC State students, it takes us back to the racial justice issues that um, we saw earlier. On April 13th, 1973, a group of Native Americans and others organized a march to support the Tuscarora people of Robeson County. They were, um, the Tuscarora were protesting against the lack of federal recognition, their misidentification misidentif as Lumbee, and the negative impacts of in integration measures in their local schools. Um, the Tuscarora had spent the night before this protest at the Baptist Student Center, which at that time was across Hillsborough Street from the NC State campus. And the march included about 20 NC State students. Um, again, that number is according to the student newspaper. Protesters marched down Hillsborough Street. There's that um, theme again. Um, they marched down Hillsborough to the, um, to the State Capitol building, again, in downtown Raleigh. And I think that protest was probably inspired um, by events that had happened in 1972 in Washington, D.C., when a group of Native Americans um, took over the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs building there um, because they were protesting um, that the U.S. government uphold tr Native American treaty rights, and they were uh, also demonst uh, demonstrating against poor living standards in Native American communities. Okay, so that is the last um, protest we're gonna look at today. Um, I am gonna move up to the stage. And um, kind of end my presentation here. The year 1973 brought an end to this era of mass protests on college campuses, including the protests at NC State. Um, in that year, US involvement in, v in the Vietnam War basically ended and new problems were arising to capture students' attention. The 1970s are maybe best known as the decade of Watergate, the energy crisis, inflation and economic stagnation, and maybe not necessarily known as the decade of protests. Um, the 60s are known as the decade of protests, even though some of those protests did kind of continue into the first couple years of the 1970s. At NC State since the 1970s, student protests reflecting national issues have flared up from time to time but the campus really hasn't seen the same level of activism that it experienced in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So with that, I want to thank you for attending this presentation and we welcome you to return to this virtual space and look at the exhibit in more detail. So as I end here, I'd like to thank some of my library colleagues for their contribution to this presentation. Um, Colin, uh, as I mentioned before, he has taken my content and made it into this wonderful virtual exhibit, and he's um, handled all the behind the scenes um, activity with the technology today. He's been assisted by Claire Cahoon and Abby Lewis, and they're also gonna help with the Q&A period coming up. And then I'd like to also thank Brooke Peters, who you saw at the beginning, and her group for handling the arrangements with your school. So my contact information is uh, displayed behind me and you are welcome to get in touch with me at any time. And with that, now I am happy to take questions or we move to the Q&A period.
and um, I'm waiting to see what questions you all may have. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, right, there's there's two components to creating. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, um, sorry, Colin. Colin is uh, talking to me, but um, you you all can't hear him. So, <laughs> I will repeat the question, which was uh, basically, how long did it um, how long did it take to create this uh, virtual exhibit? Um, so. Um, let me talk about the content um, angle of, of that, because um, that's the part that I um, put together. Um, so um, it's kind of hard to put a time frame on that, but it took a huge amount of my time to, <laughs> to create this. Um, a, lot of, a lot of this um, information um, I had already researched um, and uh, um, uh, the unit I belong to in the library, it's called the Special Collections Research Center. Um, we do blog posts um, at least weekly, sometimes more frequently. And um, I occasionally uh, talk, um, write a blog post about some interesting aspect of university history. Um, the um, Several of those blog posts um, I call uh, Fabulous 50 to um, uh, to um, kind of recognize something that happened 50 years ago. So the events of um, 1968, 1969, 1970 were, you know, just a little more than 50 years ago now. So I had um, written blog posts about, um, you know, what was happening on campus with the um, Martin Luther King assassination, um, had written uh, another blog post about the moratorium, um, another blog post last spring, actually, about the peace retreat. Um, and so for this presentation, um, you know, I took um, that, that research, which, you know, was, was finding information, but also finding images um, to, you know, kind of pictorially display that. Um, and, um, you know, kind of worked that up and gave it to Colin and he put the space all together. So, um, um, so uh, I don't, um, you know, that's, you know, pretty much, um, I guess what I can say about that. Um, Colin? Ken, as far as the, the construction of the actual 3D space itself took about two weeks, I'd say, not full time um, for those two weeks, but, you know, just kind of a design process of a couple of people involved in it. You're always going to want to spread a project like that out to take uh, enough time for everyone to be able to really put their mark on what the space looks like and everything. So we've uh, been working on this for a couple of weeks, probably about 10 to 15 hours to make a space like this. And uh, we had a question earlier about what tools were used to make this actual display environment. And all of the tools that were used to make this are actually open sourced software. Um, so Mozilla uh, is notorious for producing most of their technology as open source. So you can play with all of this um, at Mozilla Hubs, uh, hubs.mozilla.com. So I'd really encourage you if you're interested in games or media to play around with these tools because there's a lot of really cool stuff that can be built. Todd, I have some more questions from our chat here, actually. Great, uh, great, yeah. Feed me, feed me more questions. Uh, great. You said there has been a decline in activism. Do you think that will increase with the current political climate? And that's probably talking about um, on-campus activism in particular. Sure, sure. So um, the, the, the question is about, um, you know, kind of the, um, the, the, re the current political climate and um, will, uh, you know, student activism increase because of that. Um, I mean, you know, we've already, we already saw, um, um, you know, a number of NC State students um, last summer participated in the um, 
protest movement um, following the George Floyd killing here in Raleigh. Um, uh, you know, there was there was an uptick in that. Um, you know, whether they will go back, you know, to the same level of, you know, thousands of thousands of people that we saw um, in the 19, um, you know, 60s and early 70s, whether that will happen at NC State, um, I guess I don't know. Um, it, it's, um, it, I haven't seen that so far, um, but, you know, it's any, anything is possible in the future. And, um, oh, also FYI, everyone can hear my voice now, Todd, so you don't know. Okay. I think a good question to build off that response um, that compares uh, current activism a little bit again is, uh, how do you think these past protests, the ones from the presentation, compare to modern Black Lives Matter protests on campus? Similarities and differences. From yeah, that. yeah. So, um, I, you know, I mean, uh, there's, you know, there, you know, there's similar in the sense of, you know, people gather on campus, they, um, you know, hold, you know, hold their marches. Um, you know, some of the marches have, um, ha you know, from this past year have gone down Hillsborough Street. Um, you know, there's there's a connection with racial justice issues, um, you know, be, between the, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests of the past year on campus and, um, you know, the ones of the 1960s. Um, but, you know, probably the biggest difference, however, is, you know, there were a lot more people that participated in the 1960s and early 70s in the Vietnam War protests and, uh, you know, we just don't have that situation right now where, um, you know, p you know, huge numbers of people are protesting against, you know, U.S. military involvement because, you know, U.S. military involvement right now is not uh, nearly of the same scale that it was during the Vietnam War. You know, what's, a what's also another difference um, you know, and which was interesting about what they were doing in, um, you know, especially in the, in the 1969, 1970 year was, you know, things like moratorium day and the peace retreat um, where, you know, it, it wasn't so much protests that they were doing as these organizing these lectures and these discussion groups where um, people could learn more about what was going on. Um, you know, they were, you know, those events were less about protests, um, you know, less about rallies, less about demonstrations and marches, and more kind of teaching and learning events. Um, and I have not seen that um, really happening on campus um, in the recent um, student activism. It would be... Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see that come back, you know, at the same time, you know, I suppose you could say that, you know, how effective really was that um, back in the 60s and early 70s? Um, I don't know. I, you know, you could probably make an argument either way. I'm going to try to uh, combine two questions, possibly at my own peril here. Um, <laughs> The first is, uh, how does the activism from uh, this time period that we've been discussing discussing relate to uh, the campus activism, relate to the city of Raleigh overall, and the more general public activism and protests that you saw in the period? And we also have a question about Southeast Raleigh. You know, uh, we're talking to Southeast Raleigh High School today. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense that we'd have question about that particular part of the city. And we have a question about the economic equity, the question of economic equity and how it relates to the rest of the city of Raleigh in that regard. And maybe uh, if there's a particular protest history that relates to Southeast Raleigh while we're talking about the city of Raleigh. Um, sure. Um, although, um, you know, to be honest, I don't know that I really have... Um, that I, you know, can really, you know, provide a, a good answer for you. Um, Cause what really, 
has been focused on the NC State campus um, and not, you know, so much about what was going on in the broader uh, Raleigh community. Um, you know, in the, in the 19, well, in the 1960s and 70s, you know, especially like the things um, like the protests against the Vietnam War, you know, those were really focused on um, on uh, on college campuses. Um, uh, but you know, then you, you know, you've got like the events of um, February 1969, where the um, you know, where, where there was a lot of uh, interest in racial justice issues and there were, um, you know, not just the um, African-American employees on campus um, that were, uh, tr you know, trying to um, negotiate with the university to improve their conditions. But, you know, that was happening at the same time that, you know, the food workers were um, staging strikes over at UNC Chapel Hill, and um, there were African American students at Duke that um, took over um, buildings on campus there. So, what was happening at NC State was, you know, kind of happening within this broader activity that was going on in in the area, if not necessarily in Raleigh, at least in the Triangle. Um, but what, what, you know, I'm, you know, unfortunately, I, you know, I just, I guess I can't really answer your question about what was specifically happening in Raleigh at that time period and how, what was happening at NC State connects to that. Um, I would, um, you know, I'll have to do some more research on that. We have a question about whether the special collections within the NCSU libraries themselves are open to the public and how the public can interact with collection items like the ones that we've seen today. Sure. Well, um, there's one easy way that you can interact, um, uh, and, and that's that uh, we have digitized um, all the student newspapers up until I can't remember the exact date, but sometime in 2019. Um, so the student newspaper, um, the technician began publishing in um, 1920, and we've digitized everything up through 2019. That's that's actually one of the student newspapers. Uh, the other student newspaper is the Nubian Message, and that was started in 1992, and we've digitized that up until. Uh, those issues up until 2005 and, and um, uh, um, you know, the uh, coronavirus emergency is kind of, uh, kind of messed up our operations right now, <laughs> but we have plans to digitize um, more recent issues of the Nubian where um, all of our staff can return to campus. Um, the Agrimac yearbook um, has also been digitized um, from the year that began, 1903, till up until I think it's either 2005 or 2010. Uh, so for the time period that this uh, um, virtual exhibit covers, all those um, all those publications have been digitized and they're available through the Special Collections website. Um, so you can access that. Um, uh, our, our other collections, um, you know, normally um, we do have, um, we do have our reading room open. So if, you know, you can place a, uh, or you could place a research request to look at particular items and we would um, bring them out of storage uh, for you. Um, but during the um, uh, university's, um, response to the um, COVID-19 emergency. Uh, we've had to restrict, um, um, unfortunately, uh, um, uh, people coming, people who are not NC State students and faculty um, are, are not able to come into the library right now. Um, so um, to, to actually physically come and look at materials, um, uh, you know, we can't, we can't um, 
you know, accommodate those requests right now. But uh, when when the um, when the emergency is over, um, hopefully in 2021, um, hopefully by next summer, um, you know, we will be able to open our reading room to, um, you know, mem uh, people from outside the NC State community um, to come in and do research um, in our materials. But we have, digit you know, like I said, we have digitized a huge amount of materials and all that content is available. Todd, are you ready for everybody. one more question? Yeah, yeah. I think we might have time for one more. Uh, what types of media do you think have been the most revealing of student activism sentiments during the time period we've talked about today? What types of media? Um, uh, pretty much, um, you know, what I what I presented to you, the um, most mostly the student newspaper, the technician. Um, and, you know, because we've digitized that um, and uh, all that text is searchable now, um, you know, that's been, uh, you know, really a, a big help in finding information about these, about the student movements from this time period. Now, you know, at the same time, you know, it's, you know, it's one source. And so it, you know, it has a particular perspective. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, it was generally a favorable perspective towards these student movements. Um, but we know that there was criticism against um, those students who protested. Um, and other than what I've been able to find published you know, those letters to the editor in the student newspaper, I don't really have a whole lot of information about people who, um, you know, thought negatively about this, um, these protests. And I don't, you know, I don't really have a good gauge of just exactly, you know, how many students favored the protests and how many, um, you know, were against the protests. Um, it, it would be interesting to figure that out. Um, at, at this point, I'm not quite sure how to figure that out because there's really not a lot of other sources than the student newspaper. Great. Well, I think that's a good opportunity for us to wrap up for the day and uh, most importantly, thank all of the students who have joined us today within our virtual gallery today. Uh, thanks, Todd, for walking us through. I know I've learned a lot. Well, great. It's been it's been great fun. And, um, you know, I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to share this information with you. Um, it's it's a you know really interesting time period. Um, and there were some interesting things happening at NC State. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for being with us today. Have a wonderful holiday, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.